Well, thank you and good evening. For those of you who were out last evening, we asked for prayer for some of the gospel efforts that we're engaged in while we're here in the north. And uh, today we're over in Enniskillen, a business lunch, about 105 people from the business community invited for a beautiful uh, Carvery lunch at uh, the Kelly Hevelin Hotel. And uh, I was given an opportunity to present the gospel, uh, not so much a proclamation as an explanation. And uh, we had the joy of a young architect uh, professing faith in the Lord Jesus. And so thank you for your prayers. I think there were others too that the Lord was dealing with there. Well, I'd like to begin this evening by reading uh, a well-known passage in our New Testament in Acts chapter 8. You recall Philip was in Samaria preaching the gospel and there was a great awakening. But the angel of the Lord came to him in verse 26 and directed him. We see here the importance of a soul sending him from a very successful gospel campaign to intercept one man who is making his way toward the Gaza Strip. But a man who has been seeking the Lord with all his heart, who has traveled about uh, 1,200 miles over desert roads with no air conditioning, coming seeking the God of Abraham. He is returning with a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, a Greek copy, a Septuagint copy of Isaiah, and he is reading the scripture. And God sends his servants south to intercept the man. Then we see the importance of the Spirit, as the Spirit of God directs Philip in verse 29 and says, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And then we see the importance of the scriptures, because the word of God is open and he explains to him the meaning of this significant passage, what we call chapter 53, and we read in verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And so we see the importance of the Savior, introducing men and women, not so much to doctrines and ideas, but to a person who is able to save to the uttermost. And then finally, towards the end of the story, we read that uh, this man evidently had responded to this glorious message. And verse 36 says, as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And so at the end of the story, we see now the importance of a symbol, a symbol that is one of only two what is often referred to as ordinances in the church. There are some who refer to these as sacraments, but a sacrament really means the administration of holiness. The idea being that uh, in many churches, uh, sacerdotal churches or creedal churches, people are welcomed into the church who have never been saved. And in order to bring them along in the Christian life, the thought is that the church administers to them certain sacraments. And as the church administers this grace to them, they are able to live the Christian life. This is entirely foreign in the word of God. We never find such an idea in the word of God. These are rather ordinances, the word simply meaning that they are two specific requests, two things ordained by the Lord, two things that he has handed over to the church. 
and the one is baptism and the other is the Lord's Supper. <coughs> now in verse page 17 of your notes, we have an introduction that speaks about some of the fundamental differences between the Old Testament and the New. And the first thing we mention is this, that in the Old Testament, there was a great deal of ritual. There were many ordinances, if you will, uh, many different kinds of clothing that people had to wear and foods that they had to eat and sacrifices that they had to make and festivals that they had to keep. Why, the Old Testament is chock full of these things, isn't it? And it's almost a bit overwhelming when we read books like Leviticus to see the intricate detail in which these ordinances, these Old Testament rituals are explained. And we notice that in the Old Testament, everything is prescribed and virtually nothing is explained. In other words, this many ephahs, that many cubits, uh, uh, a, a lamb here, a bullock there, uh, the color blue here, purple there, gold there, bronze there, right? Everything is prescribed. Everything is given in specific detail, but nothing is explained. Why seven drops of blood there and one drop there? Why sprinkled there and poured there? Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. It was, it was a law relationship. And in a law relationship, you p tell people, just do it. Keep the law, right? Oh, what a difference when we come to the New Testament. Now, let me explain very hurriedly here. That was never God's intention. He wanted a relationship with his people. But they said, no, 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 no. You talk to Moses. Moses will get the rule book. And whatever he tells us, we'll do it. This is too scary. This God who thunders and roars on the mountaintop. No, no, no. You do this and we'll keep your distance. You know, there's something in the heart of man where he says, take my life and let it be. Period, right? <laughs> in other words, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to have this long distance relationship with God. Give me a rule book, tell me what to do, and just leave my life alone. We need to watch out against this with all our hearts, ladies and gentlemen. It is so easy to fall into this legalistic way of thinking that if I just do certain things and keep certain things, well, God will be pleased with me. God says, that's not my understanding of the relationship. I don't want that kind of a relationship. I want a love relationship. Not where it's must I, but where it's may I. Not, not where it's uh, we'll do what's prescribed of us. No, says the Lord, I don't want you to do that. When you've done all that you're commanded to do, say we're unprofitable servants. I want you to be profitable servants. I want you to have a love relationship with me where it won't be must I, it will be may I. God said, I took Israel by the hand and I led them kicking and screaming through the wilderness. I'll never do that again. I'm going to take you by the heart and you're going to love me. And it's not going to be the bare minimum that you're going to do for me. You're going to do whatever you can to bring joy to my heart. So said the Lord Jesus, I haven't called you slaves, I've called you friends. The slave doesn't know what his master's doing. If uh, suppose I, I was a wealthy landowner and uh, you were over visiting and uh, my, my gardener was there and I said to him, now listen, I want you to cut a big square out of the sod back here and I want you to put some peat moss and soil in here. And he says to me, why? And I said, well, just do it. And away he goes with his wheelbarrow and his shovel. And then I turn to you, my friend, and I say, this is a surprise for my wife. I'm making a, a rose garden. Oh, well, what did I tell you? <laughs> You're my friend. And so this is what the Lord said. I haven't called you slaves. I haven't said, just do it. That's how it was in the Old Testament. He said, no, I've explained it to you. Now, you know, sometimes preachers will tell us what to do. Just do it. That's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. God has gone to a great deal of trouble to explain to us why sisters wear head coverings. You don't just say, just do it. Don't make slaves out of the sisters. They're friends of God. 
and they should know why. And God has gone to great length to explain why. He's gone to great length to explain why baptism and why the Lord's Supper and why the things we do. There are not many of them. But in the New Testament, every one of them is carefully explained in a logical and clear and devotional way. So that it's, it's out of devotion, it's out of love and affection to the Lord that we do these things. Not out of some sense of obligation. And because we come into this new love relationship, there's virtually nothing prescribed. You don't tell someone to come to your house for dinner. You invite them, right? Well, now the preacher, you tell him, you're going to his house for dinner. Oh, I see, thank you. Well, you know, that's because I'm a servant, and you treat me like a servant. You're going to his house. <laughs> but your friends, you don't tell them. You invite them, right? Would you like to come to my house for dinner? So it would be very, very unlike the New Testament if, if the Lord Jesus had said, now you must remember me on the first day of every week. For the same reason that it would be most unlikely for me to say to my wife, now every Monday morning at 8.30 I want you to tell me you love me. Wouldn't that be a meaningful ex experience? I might as well program my computer to do that. What I want is... I mean, I might say to her, I really appreciate it when you tell me you love me, but I leave it to her as to how and when she's going to express that. And so you will search in vain in the New Testament to find a place where the Lord Jesus says, you must do it every first day of the week. We have to be honest about that. That's, that's exactly the way it is. However, those who were nearest to him, who loved him, and who, who knew his heart the best, they thought that when he said as often as you do it, he didn't mean as seldom as you do it. And they thought it was most appropriate that on the first day of every week, which was first of all resurrection day, second day secondly the birthday of the church, the day of the new beginning, that would be an ideal time. And so, on the first day of the week, when the disciples gathered to break bread, they did it. He didn't command them to do it. He requested that they do it, and that's always the way with love, isn't it? And so when we're preaching uh, these ordinances in the New Testament, we must understand that these are things that should be done willingly from our hearts, and not something that is forced upon us, not something that is prescribed. It's an entirely new relationship in the New Testament. And so we worship in spirit and truth. We worship in the beauty of holiness. Well, the two ordinances are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And a little later on, if we actually make it that far, uh, we'll have uh, a bit of a comparison between the two. But let's think, uh, first of all, about baptism. The word itself, baptism, is a, well, we'd call it a cop-out. It's a, it's a concession that the translators made to those who believed in ritual worship. The word baptism is simply the English form of the Greek word, and it should have been immersed. But there were people who didn't believe in immersion, you see. They believed in sprinkling or some other form of baptism, pouring. And uh, so, as a result, they, they fudged a bit. The word baptism cannot mean to sprinkle. It was the word used for dyeing cloth. You took the cloth and you put it under, you fully immersed it, and then you brought it out again. That was the word that was used. And so this is the word for baptism, to immerse, to submerge, and to emerge. That was the idea. And why was that the idea? Well, because it was a happy funeral. <laughs> it was a picture of a person who had realized, the Lord Jesus died for me. He, he went into death for me. But then he rose again from the dead for me. And because he did that for me, I want the world to know that when he died, I died. And when he was buried, I was buried. And when he rose, I rose. I'm linked with him. And I want the world to know that. And so this 
act of baptism was a public declaration of a personal act, something that had already happened when the person had embraced the Lord Jesus by faith and now they were making this public expression, this public show, and they were saying, I want to be publicly identified with the Lord Jesus because he was publicly identified with me at the place called Calvary. You notice the seven different baptisms that are recorded in the New Testament, one of them, of course, referring to the Old Testament, perhaps two, uh, referring to the, the Old Covenant, uh, the baptism of Israel to Moses in the cloud and in the sea, referred to in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, and using it as, here's a picture that's a picture of a picture. Uh, it's a bit like these, sometimes you'll see a photograph of a magazine cover, and when you look into it, you see that it's someone holding the cover of the magazine. And when you look into the cover of the magazine that they're holding in the picture, there's, you know how that works. Well, it's kind of like that because this passing through the cloud and the sea was a picture, but now Paul is using it not just as a picture of the children of Israel uh, identified with their leader Moses, but now he throws it up on the big screen, so to speak, and he says it's actually a picture of how we are linked to our new leader, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And we have come out of the bondage that was greater than Egypt, and we have been saved not by blood only, but by blood and water. We have been saved in Egypt from the penalty of sin. But then we have been saved out of Egypt by the power of, of, of Christ, saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin. We have been delivered to the other side and we sing the song of Moses, as it were, over the enemy that has been completely vanquished. And that was the resurrection, wasn't it? The death of Christ and his resurrection. The enemy has been completely vanquished not only sin, but death has been conquered, and we come through on the other side following our new leader. So that was the first picture given us there in 1 Corinthians 10 of Israel being baptized to their new leader. And then we have what is referred to as John's baptism. He's called John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He came baptizing, and his baptism was identifying with the nation of Israel repenting of their sin and preparing for the coming of Messiah. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And all the others were saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then John had the privilege of pointing and saying, there he is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John's call was to the nation of Israel and it was a call of national repentance and preparation for the coming of Messiah. Then we have um, the baptism of the Lord Jesus by John. At the beginning of his ministry, he went to the south end of the Jordan River. Now Jordan, Yardan, means coming down from the judge. And the Jordan River, which starts way up in Mount Hermon, makes its way down, dropping, dropping, dropping. They call it the descender until it's almost 1,200 feet below sea level the lowest spot on the surface of the earth. And it was way down there at the southern ford of the Jordan River, the Lord Jesus went to be baptized by John. It was the place where the water had opened up for the children of Israel as they crossed over into the promised land. Because the ark, a picture of Christ, had taken their place at the bottom of the river and held back the waves. The scripture says that it backed up all the way to Adam. When you're driving down the Jordan River, you'll see a sign that says, To Adam Bridge. And the water backed up all the way to Adam. And Romans chapter 5 explains what that means. That when Adam sinned, he only committed one sin. But by the time the Lord Jesus came, there was a whole river of sin that had been flowing for thousands of years. And the Lord Jesus had to deal with it all the way back to Adam. And so the Lord, symbolically in that ark, took his place in the bottom of the river and held back the the waves, and for the people of God, the river was dry. The victory had been complete, and they went through on dry ground. Again, Elijah and then Elisha came to the same spot. The water opened up. They went through on dry ground. But when the Lord Jesus came there to the same place, 
the water didn't open up for him. But the heavens opened up. He went under the waves, didn't he? This was going to be a picture, a symbol of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus as he went under all thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. And he identified with the nation of Israel on that occasion and he went under the waves and the heavens opened and we read that God the Father spoke from heaven and said this is my beloved son, I'm well pleased with him. And then the Spirit of God in the form of a dove came down Remember the occasion in Noah's day when the dove went out and it came back because there was no clean place to land. But on this occasion, the dove came down from heaven and found one clean place where the dove could land on the blessed head of our Lord Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God. But he took our place going into the river. And this was portrayed in his baptism and he refers to it later. You'll see um, number five on the list, Christ on the cross, when he said, can you be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? Referring to the waves and billows of God's wrath that would go over his holy soul. And then there was the anticipated persecution of the disciples. Uh, the Lord Jesus said they would be baptized, not with his baptism, of course, but with the waves of persecution that would sweep across the church. Then we have Holy Spirit baptism. We've looked at that already, the day of Pentecost the once for all historic act that unified all believers into one body. By one spirit were we all baptized into one body. And then we have the subject of believers baptism. Notice what baptism is not. It is not a doorway to the church, either universal or, dare I say it, local. It is not an entrance to the local church. The moment a person puts their trust in Christ, they're saved. And they become part of the universal church. The local church is to be a local expression of the universal church. And the local church is to receive those whom Christ has received. Now there are, of course, issues relative to church discipline and uh, disorderly life and so on. We understand those things that will uh, disqualify someone from entering into the full fellowship of a local church. But basically, the idea is that when a person puts their trust in Christ, they become part of the universal church and they qualify to be part of the local church. Now what happens? The pattern is they were saved, they gladly received the word, and they were baptized. This baptism is something that should be taught by the evangelists. That's exactly the model that we have in the New Testament, at least whenever we uh, read. I, I have some references a little further along here <coughs> under the ordinance of baptism. Uh, they that gladly received his word were baptized, Acts 2.41. When they believed Philip preaching, they were baptized, both men and women, Acts 8.12. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized, Acts 18, 8. The most I can find anywhere in the New Testament between the time of conversion and the time of baptism was three days. We have made baptism, we have, we have linked baptism with reception into the local church. And so saved, saved, then a long time, then baptized and received into the assembly. Whereas in the New Testament, it was saved and baptized and then perhaps some teaching on what it means to be in the full fellowship of the assembly and received into fellowship. But baptism should not uh, be some sort of corollary to fellowship in the local church. Baptism is linked with salvation. I personally believe it should be the first act of obedience of the new believer. And we do a great disservice by leaving that because here's a person who's been saved Baptism is a very simple principle. A child can understand what this means. He died, I died. He was buried, I was buried. He rose, I rose. That's it, right? So there's no reason why a new believer cannot understand that within five to seven minutes after they're saved. And if that's the case, then this is, should be their first declaration, their first act of identification with the Lord. You know, when you're first saved, you do anything for the Lord. If, if it was announced, all new Christians swim to Africa, they'd try it. 
Like when you're a new Christian, you're just so eager, you love the word, you, love, you actually love God's people, you think they're great. You like the singing, you like, you like everything. Everything's wonderful when you're first saved, you know. That's the time to say, listen, here's your opportunity to publicly identify with the Lord Jesus. He went through a baptism for you at Calvary, the waves of God's wrath, and he's asking you now to go through a baptism for him. That's when it should happen. But instead, we put people off. You know what we're doing? We're teaching them to be disobedient to the word of God. We're teaching them to take their sweet time in obeying what they know to be true. That's not a good idea, is it? If they know that this is what they ought to do, and this was part of the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them. It was, the, it was the work of the evangelist. Now, I understand there are issues, and maybe some of you will stuff the question box with questions like, a little child who trusts the Lord, should we baptize them? And what about the lemming instinct where all the children want to do it together? And I know there are, there are practical problems, and people will say, well, back in those days, of course, there was persecution. And so if a person said, I want to be baptized, that could be their death sentence. So that was a kind of filter that kept out all the hypocrites. Well, I don't think it kept out all the hypocrites. There were still some hypocrites in the New Testament church too. But I don't think that's a good enough reason to go against the clear declaration of the word of God. I, I just don't see that. Now, I'm, I'm sure there's some good uh, brethren who disagree with me, but, uh, but when I look at the pattern in the word of God, I can't find one example of a person who, on the basis of their belief, on their confession of faith, not their performance, it was, uh, Philip didn't say to the Ethiopian eunuch, now look, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to watch your life for a while, and if you perform well enough, then I'll let you get baptized. It was, it was only on the, on the confession of faith. If you believe, then he was to be baptized. Would there be some now and again that would get baptized who weren't really saved? I dare say it would happen. I think it still happens today, doesn't it? With all our carefulness, some actually slip through now and again. But... Uh, there's no reason why we should be the ones who make the determination as to whether this person is really saved or not. That's not our domain. There's one person who has the book and he knows who's really saved. We only know those who make confession, who, who make a public declaration, I'm with him. I want to be identified with the Lord Jesus in the day of his rejection. So, as we look at the subject of baptism, we see that believer's baptism is not an entrance to the universal church. Most of us would agree with that. There are some who teach that, that the way you get into, in other words, the way you get saved is by baptism. There are other people who teach that the way into the local church is by baptism. I hope we don't agree with those things. And it, the answer, the, the issue should be quite clear if we ask the question, if a person was only baptized, would they be received into the fellowship? No. No, they need to be saved. That's right. They need to be saved. There may be cases, as I mentioned here, there may be cases where um, a woman is saved, her husband refuses to give permission for her to be baptized, or a child, an underage child who's living at home and the parents for, forbid it. Uh, uh, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to uh, the, the Persian Gulf countries, uh, if someone gets saved, if they were to baptize them, they would be thrown out of the country. Well, maybe that's, that's the thing to do. If they are members of, the fa of, the, of that country, they will be executed for it. Now, what the brethren do over there is they fly them to India and baptize them. <laughs> And they have their baptisms in it. They actually pay for their plane tickets to fly them out of the country to have them baptized. But there are situations when a child is underage and the parents say no. Does that mean that this young person then cannot fully participate in the life of the local church? If it's in their heart to do it, if they are willing to be baptized, but there are other exigencies, there are other issues then it, as far as I can see, there should be no hard and fast rule. This is why we have elders instead of computer programs. Elders have discernment. And elders say, well, this young man wants to, this young woman wants to, or this wife wants to. They're not able to. There is no hard and fast law that says they can't. There are situations where uh, people live in the frozen north. They don't have a baptistry. They can't be baptized till the spring. They're saved in the fall, and they want to remember the Lord. I really don't see that there's some kind of 
hard and fast rule given to us in the word of God. The pattern is clear. They were saved, they were baptized, they continued steadfastly. And so we, we acknowledge that, that pattern, but we also acknowledge that there is no hard and fast rule anywhere that suggests that it must be so. Uh, we notice that uh, baptism is an act of obedience to the Lord. It's a simple request. He asks us to obey it. It's the answer of a good conscience to God. 1 Peter 3.21 says, it is not, it saves you. Baptism saves you, but it doesn't save you from the filth of the flesh. It saves you from a bad conscience. It's a little conversation with your conscience. And you know, if you don't get baptized, and you know you should be baptized, it's like a sore thumb. Every time you turn around, you're whacking that thumb, aren't you? You wonder how that is. It just seems like it's grown three times in size, and you always seem to be banging that sore <laughs> member. And so when, if you don't get baptized, every time you turn around, you're going to be hearing it, and it's going to be an offense to your conscience. What hinders you from being baptized, Christian? If you've trusted the Lord, you've made confession, then you need to be baptized. The Lord wants it to be so. It's also a mark of identification with the Lord Jesus in the day of his rejection. As I mentioned here, um, if you won't be baptized down here, you won't be baptized in heaven. The only sea up there is made of glass, and you won't be able to be baptized there. Uh, the young lady who uh, went to the elders and asked for baptism, and they said, well, we thought you should wait a little longer. And she said, well, all right, as long as you guarantee you'll baptize me before the Lord comes. And so it happened the following week. We need to recognize that there are some things we won't be able to do in heaven. You won't be able to suffer for the Lord there. You won't be able to sacrifice for the Lord there. You won't be able to be put to shame for the Lord there. And you won't be able to identify with him through baptism there. Those are things you can only do down here. And so it's time if you've trusted the Lord, it's time for you to be baptized. And then it is a declaration of death to the world. You're rising to a new kind of life, and you're letting the world know, I'm with him. I'm not with this world anymore. I've cut off my ties. I have no association. I, the time past of my life was sufficient to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Well, I leave that with you. Uh, there are some hard verses about baptism. I've given a few suggestions there. Some may want to ask further questions about them in uh, point six. And we come now to the subject of worship, worship in general. Uh, we're not speaking specifically of worship of the Lord's Supper yet. Christians, we should not limit our worship to an hour and a half on the Lord's Day. We should be worshipers all the time. The Lord's Supper is more focused than worship. Uh, it, it's included in worship, but it's specifically remembrance. It's calling the Lord to mind. But there are many subjects that are appropriate for worship. If the Lord gets you a job, if he provides you with food, uh, the goodness of God in the daily experiences of life, our hearts should be constantly rising up in gratitude to the Lord. We ought to be worshipers all the time, worshiping the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord should be worshipped by his people. The old English word, worth-ship, is a bit of a clue, isn't it? Worth-ship. To ascribe worth to the Lord. To express our appreciation for the person of God. Thanksgiving is an expression of appreciation for the goodness of God, for the blessings that he gives me. But worship rises above this to the person himself in all of his goodness and grace and glory. You notice the Hebrew word to bow before. Uh, very often people say Genesis 22 is the first reference to worship. That's the first time the English word worship is found, but the first time the Hebrew word is found is a few chapters before in chapter 18 when the three men come to the door of the tent and Abraham bows before the one in the center and recognizes that one as different from the other two and he worships him. And then the Greek words, the first one proskuneo, to kiss towards, which speaks of the love element it's a token of love, an expression of love. 
And then the word to revere or be devoted or to feel awe, that sense of being overwhelmed by the person I have come to worship. Uh, as, as we read concerning the Queen of Sheba, there was no spirit left in her. It's this sense of awe, of amazement as we stand in his presence, as we bow before him. And then to render homage or service. The word latruo, which is sometimes translated service, sometimes worship. It's the idea that I come before him with something. I come with my, with my basket full, as they say. I come with a heart of gratitude. I come with expressions of thanksgiving. I come to give him something. The sacrifice of praise, the fruit of my lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, number two, notice every believer should be equipped to be a worshiper. Our spirits made alive through the new birth, our minds enlightened by the Holy Spirit and by the word and our hearts aflame with love to Christ. You know, sometimes we say to the Lord, we just don't have the words. Well, it's true. We'll never have the words, certainly this side of heaven, that are appropriate for what he has done and for who he is. Nonetheless, this wonderful book, the Bible, is chock full of words, isn't it? Wonderful words of expressions of worship and praise and adoration that we can borrow and make our own and offer up to the Lord. And I encourage the young men here, who are in fellowship in your local assembly, you should come with your hearts prepared to worship and to let the Spirit of God touch your heart. Now, I don't mean to be crude about this, but the Lord's Supper sometimes is a bit like popping corn, you know? Pop, 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 and then prime time comes and everybody's popping to their feet, you see? If you come with your heart warm to the Lord already, the, the reason why things are so slow at the beginning of many Lord's Supper, suppers is that we're just not warm. We're not ready. And it takes us a while to get ready. But if you come ready, well, then the Spirit of God can call on you in the early part of the meeting, before perhaps the, the theme has been set and you're finding it difficult just to know how to fit in. You can take part early on. And there's nothing, you don't have to pray in a special accent. You know, some people have a special prayer accent. We don't need that. Uh, we want to be real with the Lord. We're not being careless. We're not being flippant. We're not being casual. But we come into the presence of the Lord. He wants us to be real. And what he wants us to do is to take some truth from the word of God and offer it up to him in appreciation. So just a verse or a couple of verses that come to your mind that, that you appreciate the truth of it and you just thank the Lord for that. And it just, can just be a minute on your feet. You don't have to pray in a long, drawn-out way. But just to have the young men come ready to offer the Lord something that they've enjoyed about Christ, something that they appreciate about him, and just offer it up to God. I used to think as a young man that I had to come up with some new turn of phrase that God had never heard before, you know. And I realized, well, no, he, he knows everything there is to about, know about the son. All he wants me to do is agree with him that his son really is as wonderful as he says he is. And just to enter in to the father's appreciation of his son. How do I find it? I find it in the word of God. And as I take some truth that's been dear to my heart and I say, Father, this is the son as, as revealed in the word what a wonderful person he is. We just are so thankful for the Lord Jesus. And just a little word of expression, how it should stir the hearts of God's people to further worship. I, I've mentioned a few helps in preparation. You know, sometimes the young people, when we begin uh, searching for things uh, to help us in our worship, um, worship is to be prepared at home. I don't mean that the words or sermons or anything like that, but just uh, our enjoyment of Christ should be through the week. The, the Lord's table is that period of time from week to week when we sit at his table and he feeds us Christ. And then the Lord's Supper is the climax of the Lord's table where I come to him with what he's already given me and I offer it back to him and I say, Lord, this is what I've discovered about the Son this week, and I agree he's altogether lovely, and I offer it back to him. As David said, we give thee but thine own. What the Lord has given us, we give it back to him. Now, if you're not sitting at the Lord's table through the week, you'll have nothing for the Lord's Supper at the climax of that period 
at the, at the first day of the week. So uh, remember to spend a little time there. But unfortunately for some young people, you know, uh, they know about Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Revelation 4 and 5, but the rest of the Bible is a Gobi Desert as far as they know. There are all sorts of passages in the Word of God that will swell your heart in appreciation to God. So you look for them. The, the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ, the, uh, the Messianic Psalms, the portraits of Christ in Isaiah, uh, in the New Testament, of course, many beautiful pictures of Christ, uh, uh, Colossians 1, Ephesians 1, Hebrews 1, John 1, 1 John 1, Revelation 1, full-length portraits of Christ, magnificent portraits. Fill your hearts with Christ, and you certainly will have something with which to worship. Now, when I say the young men, I'm not inferring that the young women or the older women uh, should not be preparing their hearts for worship either. We'll be looking at that a little later, if I ever get to it, uh, when we look at the subject of priesthood, that we are all called to be priests. Now, you notice that um, the Lord's Supper, this little section on the Lord's Supper, is a divine institution. Uh, the Lord Jesus himself instituted it the night in which he was betrayed. It's a very simple time. It's uh, to be a time of, of warmth and uh, harmony and uh, a time in which we are honestly before the Lord. We've examined ourselves. If, if we don't examine ourselves, we shouldn't come and examine him. You see, I only appreciate what the death of Christ means when I understand what a poor sinner I am and what a savior I needed to save me. And so the scripture does not say, let a man examine himself and so let him stay home. That's how we feel sometimes. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat. It's those who have examined themselves who realize what a savior they needed and what a savior they have been given. I'm going to jump down a little bit because I, I want to get to this uh, final section. And uh, it's an important one to me. The simplicity and eloquence of the symbols. Uh, you notice they both have historic scriptural significance. You can go back to Genesis 14, the story of Melchizedek and the 104th Psalm, which speaks of the bread and wine, Ecclesiastes 9:7. Uh, these things were, were rich to the minds of the Jews. Those who sat around uh, the table that night with the Lord Jesus, the bread and wine were very precious to them already. But now they had an added significance. He used the bread as a picture of his body and the wine a picture of his blood. The wine primarily is emphasizing the new covenant, isn't it? This is the new covenant in my blood. The cup was taken and he said, when you take this cup into your hand, you are remembering the new covenant. What is the new covenant? That's a good thing to ask, isn't it? When we hear him say, this is the new covenant. Now, Officially, the new covenant is going to be made with the house of Israel. But God has graciously extended the benefits of that covenant to include all who receive Christ as their savior, the Messiah, Israel's Messiah as their savior. The new covenant is this. I will write my law on their hearts and their minds and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more forever. Oh, what a wonderful unilateral covenant has been offered to us. And we take that cup with gladness and we acknowledge the death of Christ has set me free. I have been liberated from the penalty of sin and I have been brought into a new relationship, a new covenant. I don't belong to me anymore. I've been bought with a price and I want to glorify God in my spirit, in my body, because they belong to him. The, um, the emblems are both general and specific. And by that I mean uh, it, was, it was bread and it was the fruit of the vine. But that's as far as it goes. It doesn't even say wine. We can assume it was, of course. And we can assume that it was unleavened bread, but it doesn't say that. And it doesn't use the word for unleavened bread. It leaves it. Because, you see, Israel's worship was designed for people who all lived in a little country and they could do things bring a lamb for example it was it was well within their ability to do these things but now the gospel was going to go out into all the world and people were going to believe in the lord up above the arctic circle 
and in the jungles and in the teeming cities. And they're going to, they were going to break bread and remember the Lord in prison camps and all sorts of places. And they were going to have access to very specific things. And so the Lord made it general enough so that if all you had was manioc bread or rice bread or sourdough bread, it would qualify. And so it's the general word for bread. It's not a specific, again, if you have convictions about this and you feel you have to have unleavened bread, well, the Lord bless you. But that's not, and we can assume that that's what they use, but it very, it, God is very particular in not using the specific word for matzah. He uses the general word for any kind of bread so that it qualifies. I think the same is true probably about the fruit of the vine. I dare, dare say there are places that don't have grapes but they do have some fruit of the vine, and so it qualifies. The basic idea is the breaking, the distribution of the bread. There is one loaf, and the idea is that there's a loaf on the table, and at the end of the meeting, where is the loaf? Well, you have a piece of it, and I have a piece of it, and this brother has a piece of it, and this sister has a piece of it, and when God looks down, he sees that the church is, as it were, one loaf. Because the bread is not only a picture of the physical body of Christ, by the end of chapter 11, it's used as a picture of the mystical body of Christ. And we share the common life that came through the death of Christ at Calvary. We share in the communion of the cup. Communion, many, sharing in one. And we participate in the common life of the bread and in the common covenant into which we have been brought. And so we are reminded of that. That's why it's such a shameful thing when Christians come together to remember the Lord and they're at odds with each other. They're living a lie, aren't they? And those are the people who bring judgment on themselves, the scripture says. Sometimes we apply that to some poor stranger who wanders in off the street. But the idea is that there are people in the fellowship who ought to know better, who are at odds with their brethren, and they, and they actually sit down and break bread with them. And they're really living a lie. If that's the case, leave it at the altar. Go get right with your brother first and then come back, he says. That's an important principle, isn't it? God won't be mocked. And he says, if you do this sorts of thing, I'm going to have to spank you because you're, you're, you're living a lie. This is not the thing to do. If you are breaking bread and taking the cup, you are saying, I'm one loaf with all these believers and I am in a, in a common covenant that was redeemed through precious blood. And I want, I want to make it perfectly clear that I'm not at odds with these people. I'm one with them through the finished work of Christ. It's very important for us to understand that. And this is a safeguard that the Lord has built into the life of the local church so that we do set things right and we do get along. For one Christian on one side of the building to break bread with a Christian on the other side of the building but not be willing to shake hands with them is, is a shameful thing, isn't it? And we need to set those things right. And then we read that um, this, this particular gathering has certain purposes. It's to have Christ in the midst. When we come together, you know, there are many meetings of the church where we come for the mutual benefit of one another. We pray for one another. We, we share the truth of God with one another. We fellowship with one another. But the Lord's Supper is a unique meeting of the church in which it's all for him. It's all for him. It's unique. Now, at every gathering, we come to minister to one another. But at that particular meeting, we are coming to minister to the heart of God. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to think that the Lord would welcome us in. This is something brand new. In the Old Covenant, the high priest was only allowed once a year, only himself, only by blood, into the holiest. But here we are now, sinners of the Gentiles, saved by his grace. The veil has been rent in two. A new and living way has been provided for us. And when we lift our hearts, oh, think of it. I hope you never get used to the idea. When we lift our hearts in worship, we rise up past petty officials and government leaders, past presidents and kings, past demons, past angels, past cherubim and seraphim, and we step right into the presence of God. And we worship in his very presence. What a breathtaking thing that is. 
I, as I say, I hope we don't get used to it. The tremendous thing that we have, the supremacy of our Savior, the centrality of his presence, the intimacy, he's there. We're not just remembering someone in the sense that he died long time ago. The word means to call him to mind. And what we're doing as we gather, we're, we're gathering to him. He's there. We're not just remembering him in a sense of uh, fond memories of a long lost friend. We are there gathering around him and bringing him to mind and considering how wonderful he is. How could it ever be a boring time thinking about Christ? Um, I, I have reference here to accessibility. Uh, there seems to be three dis different uh, movements of the soul where we have um, uh, speaking to yourselves in songs, hymns, spiritual songs. And uh, speaking to yourselves, of course, means that this is borrowed worship. This is someone else's worship. They thought it up, they wrote it out, and I read it, and as I read it, my heart is stirred. And so my heart strings begin to move in sympathy with that hymn. It's not really my worship yet, it's someone else's worship, but I, I benefit from it, and my heart begins to pulsate with this, this common worship. And then speaking to one another through the word of God. This is not the place for, for sermons, but there is the appropriate place where we take the word of God and, and put the incense on the burning censers of our heart, as the Lord Jesus did on that road to Emmaus, uh, taking the scripture, beating it small, the sweet incense beaten small, uh, the things concerning himself out of the scriptures, did not our heart burn within us, they said, while he talked with us, by the way. And so, like that sweet incense beaten small, which speaks of the, of the beauties of Christ placed on the burning senses of our hearts. And so, an appropriate verse or two from Scripture, not long passages necessarily, but a verse or two applied to the hearts of God's people can cause us to rise in worship to him. And then, of course, the prayers that we offer, standing and praying and dear brothers, please, when you pray, make sure that you're praying in such a way that everyone can say amen. This is not the place to show off. This is not the place to use trite phrases. This is a place where we stand and speak to our blessed friend, express to God our appreciation for his son. There's no need for contrived phrases or, or false eloquence. It's just a matter of, of expressing in simple terms and yet eloquent, biblical terms, our appreciation for our blessed Lord. Now when we turn to page 20, you'll notice uh, that we've gone back in time. Uh, we've gone to uh, number five, and then lo and behold, we go to number four. This is because this chapter was done at about five o'clock in the morning, and uh, so you'll change those numbers to six and seven. Um, we've already made reference to uh, number six, uh, number seven, you'll notice, uh, compared with the other ordinance. The Lord's Supper is a picture of communion. And th in other words, the common life which we share. And therefore, it is to be done often. Whereas baptism is a picture of union with Christ. These are the two great bonds, aren't they? Union and communion. Union is the strongest bond in the world. Nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Communion is the most fragile bond in the world. And therefore, any sin, any carelessness, any thoughtlessness, any offense between brethren can damage that delicate communion which I enjoy with the Lord. So union is once. A declaration of the one time that was required to snatch me out of hell, out of the power of the enemy, and link me forever to Christ. Whereas the Lord's Supper is a picture of communion, of that ongoing enjoyment of fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And so it's to be done often. The Lord's Supper is a picture of his identification with me. He says, this is my body for you. This is my blood for you. Whereas baptism is my identification with him. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he rose, I rose. He identifies with me at the cross. I identify with him in this symbol of baptism. And then 
the Lord's Supper shows that Christ is in me as I take the bread and the cup and receive it, whereas baptism shows that I am in Christ. I, I take that place. I identify that, that his death was mine, his resurrection is mine. Now we come to this very important section at the end of the chapter, and we're getting close to being out of time. I'm sorry about that. But in the Old Testament, we have this progression. Remember that the Bible is a progressive revelation. Uh, originally, it was God's design that every man be a priest. Everyone have access into God's presence. He came and walked with Adam in the cool of the day and fellowshiped with him. But then you know how things deteriorated. Eventually, we have the patriarchs as priests over their family. And then God selects a priesthood, a one family. He selects um, Aaron and his family. But it was always God's desire. We see that uh, very clearly stated that God wanted uh, everyone to be a priest, a kingdom of priests. And we discover uh, when we read 1 Peter chapter 2 that men and women are never mentioned. It's the, the gender and gift are not an issue. Every Christian is a priest. Every brother, every sister is a priest before God. And therefore, every one of us has access into the presence of God. So when we say that the brethren are exercising their priesthood by standing to their feet and praying, it may be a little misleading. The fact is that I don't need a priest to go into God's presence for me. He is acting instead as a representative of the church before Christ. That's the word, the man is the image and glory of God. The image there is the representative. He acts as a representative of God to the assembly in preaching, in the teaching of the word of God, and of the assembly to God in prayer, praise, and worship. So he's acting as a representative, and that's why he prays in the plural. That's why he be, has to be careful when he prays that everyone can say amen, because it's everyone's prayer. Sisters, by the way, you can say an audible amen. That's all right. And maybe if you said it, the brethren would catch on. So every, everyone says, all the people say amen. And if you don't say amen, I don't think you have a part in that prayer. That's you signing your name to that brother's prayer and saying, that's my prayer too. And you sign your name to it. And we say, you can say amen, I'll still love you. Amen is the proper pronunciation. Amen. We say amen and we sign our name to the prayer. And when we sign our name to the prayer, it's our prayer, you see. But we've all gone into the presence of God. I don't have to stand, sit in my, in my seat or the sisters don't sit in their seat while the brothers go into the presence of God. The Lord doesn't hear our lips. He doesn't hear our voices. When we say that the, the men are able to speak and the women are silent, we're really being inaccurate on both counts, aren't we? When we say the men can speak, we don't mean it's a town hall meeting. We don't mean it's a free-for-all. What we mean is only that brother whom the Spirit of God wants to use at that time is free to speak. Anyone else would be out of order. And when we say the women can't speak, we only mean they don't speak as far as we're concerned. Well, we're not the ones receiving the worship. The one who receives the worship is not listening to our voices. A man can stand and speak his heart as cold and his heart as stone, and his prayer doesn't get any higher than the ceiling tile. What God is hearing is the worship of our hearts. And so when... Um, the worship is being offered to the Lord, the sister is as free to go into the presence of God and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness as any man. So when we say the women are silent, we only mean they're silent as far as being representatives. That's why when we sing, we, the, my wife starts to sing, I don't say, shh, 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 honey, please. Don't you know you're supposed to be silent? Why, why can she sing? Well, because she's not acting as a representative, is she? She is acting as a priest, and like all the rest of us, we all unitedly sing. We're not acting now as representatives, but as individual priests, and we're welcome to do that. When we say amen at the end of a prayer, we're acting as individual priests. What is not allowed is for a sister to take a representative role because, well, she would be playing out of character. The man plays the part of Christ, the woman plays the part of the church, and there you would have the whole thing reversed. You would have a symbol of the church telling Christ what to do. And that would never do, would it? So that order is set, but the sisters are absolutely free. They should be encouraged to meditate on Christ and to come. And that's why a, a few quiet spots, 
during the Lord's Supper is very appropriate. Not painful silences because the brethren have not been in the word of God and they have nothing in their baskets to give the Lord. But the, the Spirit of God will allow certain quiet times through the meeting when the sisters are able then to offer their worship to the Lord. So when we think about priesthood, as holy priests and royal priests, we are built up to offer up spiritual sacrifices as holy priests. We are to go forth and show forth his virtues as royal priests, that is to worship and to witness, both vertically and horizontally. Every one of us has the privilege of being worshipers and witnesses. There is no limit on this, brothers and sisters. You can worship all you want. You can witness all you want. There's no limit. I've left a little outline at the end, what priesthood involves, a kind of corny little acrostic on P-R-I-E-S-T. I hope at least one person in the crowd appreciates it. Well, <laughs> our time is long gone. I hope you have some good questions this evening, uh, some that don't blow me out of the building, and we're going to have a little time of prayer. Our Father, as we have been considering this amazing development, that sinners of the Gentiles have not only been saved, have not only been brought across the ruins of that middle wall of partition which was broken down and brought into this new covenant, but then the veil has been removed and we have been brought into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And here we stand this evening. We're just so amazed at this that we're speaking face to face with God, the God who loves us, the God who has manifested himself to us, the God who wants us to spend forever with him. How could we not worship thy son for what he's accomplished? And we would do so this evening. We would unitedly lift our hearts to thee and say, O oh God, there is no one like the Lord Jesus. Well done, Lord Jesus. Thou hast triumphed gloriously. We adore thee. We admire thee. Thou art our champion, our hero. When we needed a, a friend, thou, the friend of sinners, came to our rescue. We'll never get to the end of it. We'll never get over it. Forever and ever, we'll be discovering fresh reasons to praise thee, new reasons to love thee more, as we discover that thou art indeed all together lovely. We thank thee for this time together. Pray, O oh, oh God, that it will be helpful to all of us in our daily experience, that those of us who were baptized a very long time ago in our hearts will go back to that day and remember the resoluteness of our hearts and our desire to stand up for Jesus. May it be true in our lives today and that we perhaps who have some difference with a brother or sister in our local fellowship, we'll seek to make it right before the Lord's Day, that in happy fellowship together, we might live out the truth of the one body, the one loaf, and the common communion, the, the new covenant into which we have been brought. We pray for the young men and young women we thank thee for those who have learned to be servants. We pray that they all might learn to be worshipers and that they might find their places around these simple emblems week by week in happy fellowship with the people of God and in happy worship with the God of heaven. We thank thee, Father, for those who have been baptized and pray for those in the audience who have not yet taken that public stand. We pray that if they've truly trusted the Savior, it won't be long until they stand up for him and let the world know they belong to that man of Calvary. We give thee thanks now for this little break and fellowship together. Help us to be encouragers one of another. We ask in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen.